Well, we're going to get back into our study. Um, so that is why we're here. Hi, kids. They're married now. Oh. And Trey looks happy and Mira looks stressed. <laughs> um, we understand. We understand. Is it switched? You think it's switched? I don't think so, Trey. <laughs> Anyways, but getting back into our study, as most of you guys know, we've been in a, an extended study on the life of Christ. We've been in about 16 months now. And um, then we've been doing smaller sections after we got past some of the amount of different categories of things that he did, like we just finished up um, the healings of Jesus, we're getting ready, to, uh, we're rolling towards in January, the parables of Jesus. Um, but right now we're in, originally I was going to call it the practicals of Jesus, it's like the things of practical day-to-day -day life teaching. Um, but we found that it's really talking about kingdom living. What does it look like to live the kingdom of God now to, and today? And so two weeks ago was kind of the passion part of that study series, that when we talked about what does kingdom living look like um, and trying to define it, but also try not to overly define it from a standpoint of it's just so huge, I don't think we can get our head around it. Uh, but we did, Chris, I'm going to need your help, Ken. We did have a, um, a working definition that we were kind of running with that Chris will put up for us. That is, the kingdom of God is freedom from oppression, healing, and wholeness, hope, peace, and joy. We'll leave that there for a second. And the reason why I say it's somewhat of a limited definition, because again, it kind of gives us something to measure off of or something to gauge off of uh, as far as the different areas of our life of we're living the kingdom of God. But again, I don't think it encompasses all of it. And so then we've been moving into the more practical aspects of things. And so last week we talked about time, in my time and my schedule and the way that I live my day. Am I experiencing wholeness and hope and peace and joy? Or do I find areas of oppression? Or do I find areas that don't work well? And we looked at how Jesus dealt with that and how he taught about that to take and move into some new freedom in our own lives. Today we're doing pretty much a similar thing, but we're going to be looking at finances. I think all of us can agree that time and finances are two massive things that we all deal with on a consistent basis. So today we're going to talk about finances from a standpoint of living. Now last week I started out, gave you a little quote we're going to get us going. Uh, I'll give you one here um, from the great Billy Graham. If a person gets his attitude towards money straight, it will help straighten out almost every other area in his life. How many people agree with that statement? Hmm? Okay, is that a yes, I agree? Or you, no, I'm not so sure. Because here's the thing. Yeah, as I always say, there's the Bible part of my teaching that you're stuck. I mean, it's the Bible. You've you got to deal with it. Then there's Tom's commentary that you can either like or throw away or whatnot. I think Billy Graham's a little bit closer to this side. I think you have to kind of take... No, I'm just kidding. But I think it's true, to be honest with you, if you get the right attitude, not that you have enough money, not that you don't have enough money, not that if you got all the bills paid, if you don't have the, the, all the bills paid, but if you have the right attitude, a kingdom of living attitude towards your finances, then it really does make a big difference in your life. So we're going to look at that with the life of Jesus. Now, um, one of the things that someone knows, when I, when I talk to people, I don't think in normal cultural Christianity, like we've been kind of using that as a bar, um, a lot of people realize that Jesus had to deal with finances. Um, he had to deal with finances all the time. We don't see these massive um, testimonies about it, even though there's over 2,000 references to finances in the scripture, which is actually more than prayer and uh, faith added together, I think it is. Even though it's, it's, I mean, there's something about resources and finances, and I think it's like 45% of his teaching. But we don't see him struggling with it because he had the right attitude towards money in the first place. And we'll see, see how that plays out. But uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start you with this. For instance, um, if you go to Luke 8, we'll put this up on the screen for you. And they, again, if you're using new version, if just the next scripture, if you would, Chris. No, never mind. Go back up. There it is. Um, the, there's several areas where he's talking about uh, from Jesus' example. This one is a, uh, one that always stood out to me. It, is, uh, it says, soon afterward, Jesus went on through the cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and I think we're all pretty familiar with her. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's household manager, 
and Susanna and many others who provided for them out of their means. Um, this is the one reference we have about people financially supporting Jesus' ministry. Uh, and I think the reason why this always stood out to me is because uh, Joanna kind of cracks me up. Um, we don't know anything about Susanna. And again, there's many others that are referenced there as well, uh, generically. But Joanna's husband is Herod's household manager. In other words, he works for the king that can't stand Jesus, that is threatened by genius. He gets a paycheck and it goes to helping Jesus. Some of these that cracks me up. Uh, and then on top of that, the other thing I like about it is, again, it, it, if we're using educated biblical imagination, we can't look at everybody as either a bad guy or a good guy. There is intertwining throughout this with people seeking Jesus and how they, these things work. And this is one of those ex examples of Herod's household manager's wife supporting Jesus. Uh, the next one that we're, uh, I, I, we won't put up on the screen, but it's John 13:29. If you want that for our note takers, John 13, 29, um, has, is one of the mentions of where the, Jesus had a treasurer. Who is Jesus' treasurer? Judas. 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 He was the one that kept the money bag. Um, so that there, there was financial support that they needed to be able to do the work that they, they did. And so he did deal with those issues. We also noticed you know, that Judas oftentimes stole from the money bag, um, which would cause financial stress, I'm sure. Uh, actually, the only time we hear anybody stressing out about money, it's because Judas is upset that uh, the woman took and poured perfume on Jesus' feet and stuff, selling it, because he said it could help the poor, even though he just wanted it for himself. So there are financial issues in there, but we, that's not how we see Jesus really kind of respond to things. So uh, I wanted to look at one of his teachings as kind of our, our running point, and then we'll, we'll go from there into uh, some other items as well. But if you would, let's go ahead and get our Bibles open. We're going to go over to Matthew chapter 6. Uh, and start that in verse 19. And we're studying a section of scripture that we actually covered not too super long ago, just probably within the last four or five months when we went through the Sermon of the Mount. Uh, but I want to look at it from a little bit of a different perspective. That's one of the things I love about the Holy Spirit and scripture. Um, and let it bring out some new details to us as well when it comes to f having financial freedom um, as far as kingdom living in our lives. And uh, so here again, Jesus has been doing the Sermon of the Mount. He's teaching on several things. And he starts talking about laying up treasures uh, in heaven. Laying up treasures in heaven. Um, and so we're going to start out in verse 19. 19. Um, where it says this, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The first point that we're going to kind of pull out for our note-takers in this when it comes to living uh, in such a way financially, the first point is um, that we need to invest properly. We need to invest properly. And from a worldly perspective, that means something different to me today than it did 20 years ago. I'm getting a little bit older. I'm starting to think about I, I, I've shared before, I don't believe there's a such thing as retirement from ministry. I think, we'll call, I think when I retire from ministry, I'll be dead. Uh, that's when God calls me home, but I won't always be the guy up here. And, and so, you know, you start thinking about f how to provide for your family and provide for your spouse and those type of things in the future. Uh, and different people have different advice, and, and there's a place for those things. But according to Christ here, what we really need to be focusing on is the investment in the kingdom of God, our investment in heaven, the things that do not de uh, get destroyed, the things that do not rust. Uh, when it comes to investments, if you're uh, blessed as such to be able to have investments in your life as you're preparing for your life, uh, we know after the pandemic just how quick that can go away. Uh, those things go away. We take and get real excited about a new iPad that we just got and put it on a credit card and throw the thing at the trash or sell it at your sale because they don't update it anymore while you're still making payments on your credit card. The reality is that the things of this world do pass. They do perish. And so Jesus is kind of starting the conversation of making sure that we're looking at it properly, we're investing properly, because the things that I do with, let's say, 50 bucks for someone that has a need and share with them Jesus is so much better investment than taking my family to Applebee's for a night. It's a different way of thinking about how we're using, using our finances. A lot of people will say, like, 
the money is the root of all evil. That's not what the scripture says. First Timothy says it's the root of all kinds of evil because of the way that we look at finances. And so investing properly, having that kind of mindset is where Jesus kind of starts to warm us up a little bit. As we continue into it, uh, verse 22, he then says, The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? And I, I find that last line a little bit haunting. Uh, basically, the second point that we'll, we'll give you is very similar to a point that we've had uh, last week. But Jesus cared more about his vision or the mission than earthly needs. Chris, if we can put that up on screen. Jesus cared more about the vision and mission than the earthly needs. That when it came to his time, he was very conscious about how limited time is and how, how that he had to work that for the kingdom and for that ministry. Same thing with, when it came to finances, when he taught about finances. If your lamp is light, if your vision is right, then you're going to be living differently when it comes to how you spend your finances, invest your finances, keep your finances, don't have, what you do when you don't have the finances you need. That's going to look very differently when you're looking at it from a kingdom perspective, a vision perspective, a mission perspective. And what's the haunting about that last line to me is if you know that, and Jesus exhibited that, and he died and rose again so we can have that, and then we choose to be like the rest of the world, how dark is that darkness? How, how, how crazy is that, that we have this, this method of light and we choose another way? How dark is that darkness? So we have to make sure, again, um, that we bring that same mentality that we talked about with our time last week. Verse 24, no one can serve two masters. Just in case you were starting to wonder if he's actually talking about money or if I'm trusting things. Uh, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in money. The third point is you got to put God first. And this one I kind of worked with a little because if you remember back on time, that was the first point. You got to put Jesus first. You got to put God first in your, your schedule and uh, how we manage our time, we steward our time, and how Jesus did that. And so it seemed to me, just in my own self, that should be first, period. But then I was thinking, well, no, Jesus knows what he's doing, so I should probably just go in the order that Jesus was going in. And it does make a lot of, a lot of sense to me as far as some of that ways priming this up into of what we should be embracing, what we should be knowing, and then the reminder we've got to put God first in our finances. And I would venture to guess a good majority struggle with that. Struggle with that. Now, usually that's when you turn, you know, pastor turns into, hey, let's talk about tithing and putting God first in your finances. And it's appropriate. It's appropriate to do. I'm not trying to put that down. I mean, we won't talk about tithing. Um, but I don't want that to be the only thing within it. And I want to make sure that we see it beyond, hey, if you don't do your tithing, we can't take and pay for some new bus or something like that. But like we have a bus. Let's try and find a quick example. It didn't work. Can't buy Rudolph on DVD and see if you're right or if I am. Um, I have it. I have it. <laughs> you have it? Oh, yeah. Tommy's about to come up here and do a skit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but I will tell you this. I, I've been reading this book uh, that Monica keeps trying to steal for some reason. Uh, and you know me. I don't like to read except for to study. That's the only time I really read. And uh, if you're interested at all, it's called Move by Compassion. Uh, if you want to write that down. Move by Compassion by Jamie Lindsay. L-I-N-D-S-A-Y. And it, it's all about transforming the church by transforming the community and how to do so. People uh, that will need to minister to them but not become like a codependent uh, community where you're actually holding them more than helping them. And most of it's along the lines of um, Love, Inc. mentality. Um, if, for those who aren't aware, my wife is the executive director of Love, Inc. Well, it's now about to become Aspire Ministries. And uh, it's got some really good stuff. But the part that really kind of jumped out at me is she did like a three-page history on tithing from a biblical standpoint and the different ways that God uh, used that and what he taught them with it. And if you ever want to read it, you, again, you can buy the book, you can borrow it from me. I'm still kind of thumbing through it, but it's about like a page and a half if you want to look at it. But the summary itself is what stood out to me because, again, we have to talk about the tithe because it's talking about putting the 10% of our first fruits to God, our best to God. Um, and if I'm not putting my first fruits to God, then I'm already behind the ball. So it's got to be talked about. And um, this, is, this is what she talked about. And this is a, a bigger picture than what I think sometimes we get presented to in the church. 
But as she was talking about the history, she said, you could see how God was teaching the Israelites very important lessons along the way as it relates to the tithe. First, giving is meant to be cheerful and out of devotion to him. Then he taught them to care for one another. Next, he instructed them to use the tithe to, to teach them about caring for those who take care of his house and perform priestly duties. Lastly, he taught them to use the tithe to care for those who could not care for themselves, such as orphans and widows. But he didn't ask them to do this by stretching this finite amount of 10%. He blessed them beyond measure so that as he, was, as he blessed them, the tithe would be increased. And so it's a, it's a, I lo love that picture of it because it's not just, hey, guys, we all need to tithe. You know, and then we, we, it, it is a finite amount from a worldly standpoint. We have so much you know, in our budget, and you guys can see that any time that you want to. Uh, but that God continues to move in such a way that he provides for the ministry of the local body church that we're plugged into um, through, through the tithe. And uh, I just I, I, I love that picture of it. And I was looking at uh, some things from our standpoint as a church um, that he's been doing that in certain areas. Like it, it's been, I was talking to my brother who's not a Christian last night just about how amazed I am, how things went from the pandemic um, because there was an increase of people saying we're in this together. And we're actually seeing change in our, our financial faithfulness because of that. Uh, we actually got, I don't know if we ever really talked about it too much, but one of those PPP loans at the beginning because everybody was freaking out and didn't know what was going to go going on. Do you know what I'm talking about with the PPP loans, the help businesses and ministries and stuff? Um, at the end of that, for a multitude of reasons, we just gave them the money back um, because God took care of things in-house and and it, it just it, it became more of a headache, and we just didn't feel comfortable with it. So we, we sent the money back to the government. So, um, And I see different people moving in faithfulness in new ways over the last several months uh, and seeing testimonies. I see other people struggling with it uh, that have been pulling back. Um, I had one buddy of mine kind of touch base where they were kind of struggling a little bit because uh, they wanted a place that they were tithing right now. And they're like, gosh, everybody else in the church tithes, and I don't tithe. And 35% of us tithe in the church. I mean, it's not like something we all half nailed. Uh, and it is something I think God calls us to, but it's also something we don't beat each other up about. You know what I mean? We always think others to grow in faithfulness, those type of things. So, so we do, ha do have things of that nature. Uh, some other things within that ballpark, we'll put up Mark chapter 12, 41 through 44. It talks about time that Jesus sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money in the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums, and a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which would make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said, said, Truly I say to you, that poor widow has put in more than all those contributing to the offering box, for they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Uh, and th this one is one that always captures me by biblical imagination, too. First off, Jesus sitting down and watching everybody put in their tithes is like me following Mary around with the offering plate to see how much money you put in. <laughs> I don't think I'd be real well received. You know what I mean? And that kind of, it's kind of an odd thing Jesus is doing. But yet again, it's not about the amount. It's about the heart that he, that he uh, leans into. Matter of fact, there's another section where the Pharisees are putting in their tithes, and it's quite a bit of money. And uh, Jesus says, says to him, you're tithing, which you should do, but you're not loving. You're, you're, you're not helping people in need, and you need to do both. Um, Jesus has had a real good, strong way of, of looking at those type of things, which I, I, I love as well. But again, putting God first uh, in our finances is not just about tithing. It's about everything. It's about everything. It's how we pay our bills. It's how we worship him. It's how we move forward. Uh, and putting him first instead of ourself, our own needs. Um, you can, and maybe I get ahead of myself, but you can worship uh, God by paying your electric bill because he calls us to be responsible people and not be like other people in the world. There, there's a lot of ways that we can worship. It's all about our heart, heart set and how we move forward. Um, give you this one, Matthew 19. If you want to look this up, Matthew 19. Uh, 21 through 26 is a kind of a more well-known um, one as well where they... Uh, it was a, the young man that was rich and had a lot. He said, Jesus, I want to follow you. He said, go sell everything you've got, give it away, and then follow me. Um, I've heard people say that that's what you need to do to be a Christian. You Christians are a bunch of hypocrites because you've got possessions and you haven't sold. That's not what Jesus said. He said, I'm looking at your heart, brother, and you've got an idol between you and me. And you need to get rid of that idol. And so even though I'm not saying you need to go home and sell everything out of your house and sell your house on top of it, <coughs> I am saying we need to watch out for those idols and do whatever it is to submit to the Lord. 
So with that, we'll keep moving on. I can talk about that one too long. I probably already have. Verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. Some of us are already challenged. Okay. <laughs> Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you eat or what you would drink. Know about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap or gather into bones, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Number four, he cares about needs as well. Chris, if I could. Number four, he cares about needs as well. Now, this is going back to verse number two. We were saying he cares more about his vision. He's more focused on his vision than he is about worldly needs. Number four is, but he also cares about the needs. He also cares about the, the needs and shows that in multiple different ways as he goes through it. Um, a couple of scriptures I'll give you for that. They won't be up on the screen, but uh, Matthew 22, 15 through 22. Uh, they're, they're trying to trap Jesus up about paying taxes. Jesus, do you, do we, should we be paying taxes? Now, um, all of us kind of wish Jesus said no. Uh, that's not what he said. And one of the things before we get into what he said, you have to keep in mind him in taxes is different than you and I in taxes. We're, we're not, he's under Roman oppression, unrealistic taxing going on. You can't compare it to what we go through with taxation, with representation, those type of things at the same level. This is downright oppressive, that, what they're dealing with. You have to think more like Robin Hood and the Sheriff of Nottingham type stuff where people are just being abused in their taxes. That's what he's being asked about. And it would be a great time that if Jesus was coming as a physical revolutionary, that he could have stood up and say, no, let's take them down. But instead he says, well, whose face is on that coin? Caesar's. Well, give to Caesar what's Caesar's and give to the Lord what's the Lord's. The, he, he deals with the need. You and I are going to always still be paying taxes for the rest of our life. But, faithfully, faithfully they're used for the right reasons and not the bad. Matthew 17, 24, 27 is kind of a similar story. Matthew 17, 24 through 27. Uh, this one's on the temple tax. Not the, not the Roman tax, but the temple tax. So in other words, they had tithes and offerings, and then the, uh, the Jewish leaders had gotten to the point that they're taxing you on top of the taxes of the Romans. And one, these couple guys come up, these uh, disciples of another rabbi, and they're talking to Peter, and they're like, hey, does Jesus pay the temple tax? Now, culturally, he shouldn't. He's a rabbi. Rabbis don't pay, pay, pay it. But this, this was a test that they were putting up. And Peter goes, yeah, he repaid the temple tax. And then he goes over to Jesus, away from the guy, he goes, did we pay the temple tax? <laughs> did we? That? It's just so funny to me. And uh, Jesus says, well, let's talk about this. And he goes, who pays taxes? The king's children or strangers? Peter goes, well, strangers. The king's you know, children don't have to pay, pay taxes. He goes, right, so, so it is with the kingdom of God. But let's pay it anyways. Let's pay it anyways. And if you look at it, this is one of the last times that he gets to talk to Peter before everything falls apart. And part of me thinks that he wants to be able to keep unity on something that doesn't matter that much. And part of it, I think he doesn't want the distraction of the ministry that's in front of him. Uh, do you remember how he paid it, though? He told him to go fishing. He caught a fish, opened it up. The tax was inside the mouth of it. Man, that would be great. <laughs> that would be great. <sighs> 27. And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to a span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles, and in this case what he's talking about is th those are worldly. For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your Heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Uh, but this is why I'm going to put this up, out there. We should have rest in the area of our finances. We should have rest in the area of our finances. The question is, do you? That's where it starts making the turn to where we, we can start to uh, you know, self-evaluate a little bit. If I'm supposed to be living in kingdom living, do I have rest? When it comes to my finances, whether I'm on a fixed income, whether I have a 
ton of resources, whether I'm stressed out about goals, not needs, whether or not I'm stressed out about my 401k. Okay, so maybe do we have rest, which is what it's being called to here when it comes to our finances? And if not, verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. In this one, putting God first, which is number six, put God first, is repeated as a bookend. All these things will be added to you. He will take care of all of it. You can have 5,000 plus people walking to you that you need to feed for lunch and all you guys a little bit of fish and bread. God's got it. When they were all walking up, if you remember, Jesus tested, tested the disciples. He said, how are we going to feed all these people? Philip said, I have no clue. We don't have enough money. And Jesus said, like, oh, I think we got this. We should be able to have rest in this by putting God forward. So, um, I want to give you some practical things within this, some things to maybe to consider. And again, if you, if you struggle, um, you, the, there's a lot of different ways we can help you with that. We'll talk about it as we go. But I was reading this blog from uh, tithely.com on, on some things when it comes to finances. And I'm going to share with you some of their bullet points. Uh, and then later, if you watch the church Facebook page, I will post this blog for you because there's so much scripture in it. There is no way we could cover all of it today. It would be a great Bible study this week for you if you want to go deeper into it. But they had some practical points, and we'll put them up in, in a list form here. But things that you can do that are practical to kind of find some freedom or grow in this area. One is remember God owns everything. Everything. We are just stewards. If you, if you think, hey, I'm the one who worked hard for my paycheck, so that money's mine, I tell you, God will sooner or later remind you by you losing that job or some catastrophe coming, and you drop down your knees saying, dear God, help me. Dear God, help me. You need to provide another job. You need to provide another means. God owns everything. We're just stewards. Secondly, money is about discipleship. Debt, abundance, fixed income, all of it is about discipleship, how we're going to be like Jesus and how, and how we handle those things he entrusts to us. Uh, last week, I said a comment, and I, I'm going to be honest. I think uh, some people in the room were like, whatever. Um, but I still stand by it. Is if you do not keep some kind of schedule to disciple your time, you're probably really messing up when it comes to your time and how you, how you steward your time, whether it be on paper, whether it be on your phone, whether it be in your laptop, whether it be your spouse smacking you upside the head because you've got to be out of here in five minutes to make the appointment, whatever the case may be. Uh, good shot you run late often. Good shot you miss deadlines. Good shot that you have all kinds of different challenges that come up if you don't manage it in some way with the schedule. Exact same happen things happens with your finances. You need some way to manage your finances, computer, paper, little checkbook, whatever the case may be, to be able to do that. And if you don't know how to do that, we offer counseling in that. I'll sit and, and work through some things with you to help with that. Uh, again, worship with your money. It's not just church. I mean, sure, tithes and offerings are part of that. But how we're generous to other people, how we take care of other people, how we pay our bills on, on time when we can, uh, how we get assistance when we need assistance, uh, is worshiping with our finances. Uh, fight for contentment. Uh, if you're not familiar with this verse, 1 Timothy 6, uh, somewhere in like 6 through 12, 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 12, uh, Paul makes a statement that says, godliness with contentment is great gain. And I, that's an awesome verse, and I've been learning more about that as I get older. Godliness with contentment is great gain, gain. When I stop trying to buy the latest thing and I stop trying to keep up with the Joneses and I keep stop trying to have a certain image or whatever the case would be, and I'm content with what God has and I'm used using the opportunities in front of me, it is so much more peaceful. So much more peaceful. Um, just keep in mind, more money equals more problems. That's not more money. It's more money, isn't it? More money, more problems. I got to get it in there. And that's true, too. I, my son, uh, again, most of you guys know he, he has a franchise of, of Mac Tools down in Florida. He runs a truck, and he's been doing really well with it the last two years. And he's dying to add a second truck. He's training a guy right now. He's been looking at trucks to buy the whole nine yards. And uh, we were talking about it when I was down there a couple of weeks ago. I said, that's great, and that might be the way to go. But realize this, adding a staff member, adding a truck, adding more inventory, it's going to add a lot more headaches. If you, if you like the one truck experience, it doesn't mean you're going to like two truck experience. Um, we had a, a group that was real big on evangelism, not, not part of our church, but they were using our church to meet. And they had a ministry on evangelism, and they were doing great, great things. And he said, man, this is going so good. We're going to turn it into a church. I was like, okay, can I talk to you about what a church does? And, and we talked about the five pillars of what churches 
have to offer, and uh, biblically. And uh, he looked at me, I don't, I don't want to do discipleship. I don't want to do worship. I just we like evangelism. And don't try to be a church. If God doesn't call you to start a church, don't do it. It'll kill you. It'll kill your family, and you're going to end up hurting people. Uh, but if you got ministry, it's great on evangelism. Do your ministry, it's great on evangelism. But don't, don't bring on these other things. Godliness or contentment is great, great game. Okay, knock on doors for uh, provision. Knock on doors for provision. There are, um, if you're on fixed income, if you're struggling, if you're throwing things around like Heather in the front row. <laughs> <sighs> My goodness. You people are difficult today. Um, there's a lot of different ways that God provides. I remember when we had the bookstore. God let us sell enough stuff today that we could pay this bill. Not enough money come in. Next thing you know, you open up mail and you find a credit from that exact same company that pays for the bill. God does it in any way he wants. Um, so work is your number one way of getting provision. Scripturally, if you're able, do it. Uh, if not, uh, the, the, there is, we have the benefit of the state helps us out. And there are the opportunities there. Provision, your family is a source of provision if you have family. Church is a source of provision, both as a body, like if you come into the elders and whatnot, but also as individuals. This book I was talking about, they had a big conversation of what's the responsibilities of the church versus the church members when it comes to helping one another. Because there are people out there that's just like, oh, you need food? Hey, Tom, go get them food. Or the elders, go get them food. Kids, go get food. Well, God might put that on our plate to be part of that and, and be part of that. And then other local ministries as well. As I already mentioned, like Love, Inc., Aspire, Voice of Hope, uh, Leapin. There's a lot of different opportunities out there. The main issue is not necessarily that the need, that the provision's not out there. The main issue is usually up high. Usually our biggest struggle. Um, and we also want to make sure, just another side note, the Bible's also very clear that if you have family, your family is to provide for you before the church does or before ministry does. Uh, because there's people who don't have family, and those resources are supposed to go to them. Uh, if your family is not helping you, please touch base with us so we can help you. That's on your family, not you. Um, and God, Jesus is actually pretty <laughs> sassy about that, but we'll look at that for us another day. Okay, next one, kill greed. Kill greed. Kill the desire of always wanting more. We'll put this scripture up for you. It's the next slide. It's Proverbs 28, 25. A greedy man stirs up strife. Also a greedy woman. But the one who trusts in the Lord will be enriched. If you're always wanting more, it's not going to be contentment for godliness. Uh, back to the list. Be mindful of debt. If you are a um, Dave Ramsey guy, Dave Ramsey puts debt as equal to Satan. Uh, I don't. Uh, there, there are all different scriptures about debt. It does not forbid debt, but debt is an evil, evil thing if you if you use it the wrong way and you let it overwhelm. I don't mind having a house payment. I don't mind having car payments, and we're very mindful about anything outside of that. Uh, and here's the reason why. Next slide is Proverbs 22, 7. The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is a slave of the lender, and we're not created to be slaves. It puts us into bondage, and it takes away that 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 that, that type of living. So, Again, when we're talking about God, we're talking about tithes and offerings. When we're talking about God, we're talking about generosity. When we're talking about God, we're talking about our mission. When we're talking about God, we're talking about our needs. So those are some of the things that we, we definitely need to look at. Uh, so, again, contemporary proper view of finances. I'm going to kind of wrap things up with a quote from Paul Tripp, uh, if you'll find that for me, Chris. Uh, and some, some of our guys are going to know... Uh, Paul Tripp from some of our men retreats that we've had over the last uh, couple years. Um, but I was reading some of his studies, and this is something he said that I think just really stood out to me. He says, how would your finances change if you loved God's kingdom so much that is where you wanted to invest your time, energy, and money? And that's what I'm going to read again, because I know what our heart intent is, and I know what life sometimes brings to us. How would your finances change if you love God's kingdom so much, that is where you wanted to invest your time, your energy, and your money. How specifically would a God kingdom focus serve as your defense against frivolous and selfish spending? Are you ready to pray your will be done right here, right now, in my finances, as it is in your heaven? If you would budget with God's kingdom in view, how would your budget change?
True, God honoring financial sanity is only ever found when you surrender the kingdom of self to the greater purposes and the eternal vision of the kingdom of God. Again, I know the passion of all of this was two weeks ago. And if you've not gone through that study, I, I highly encourage you, whether it be YouTube or Facebook or a website, to go back and really get the vision behind what our life should look like and imagine what our life should look like versus what we have. But to get there, to get there, we have to follow Jesus' example and teaching. We have to follow the Lord and what he has for us. And I think it can make a major, major difference. Will you guys pray for me? Dear Holy Father, we are very thankful for you and your provision. I know all, probably all of us, no matter where we are financially, Father, there's something about our sinful nature or just about our worldly nature that just always wants more and we always see things that we don't have that other people have and we wish by comparison that we could have more money or have more stuff. We, we look at people, Father, sometimes that are worth struggling and they're flourishing and they denounce you and do all kinds of goofy stuff with their finances, and we wonder how that makes any kind of sense at all. Father, there's so many different mindsets we can fall into, but the one you invite us to is your mindset. The one that you invite us to is to realize that we are not orphans anymore, that for anyone who's accepted Jesus as leader and forgiven their life, by acknowledging with their mouth that he's the Son of God, and believing in their hearts that he died and rose again, saying, you're God, I'm not, and I'm following you, that we're not orphans, but we're king's children. And we have an abundance that doesn't make sense to the world. And all of us sitting here, no matter where we're at financially, can say, I am clothed, I am fed, and all of us can find areas that maybe I need to drop the pride and ask for some help. Maybe I, I need to realize the abundance I'm blessed with and tailor it and steward it in ways that take care of others, that lean into God's work, that takes care of my family in a way of worship instead of a place of it's all on my shoulders. And move us into a place where we start dreaming about what kingdom of God living looks like with our finances, about what you can do through us if we say yes to you instead of trying to control things all the time. Father, that's what I pray that you awaken in our hearts and that we do in such a way that turns everything upside down. Help us make those commitments as we ponder the questions from Paul Tripp and from your word on a new lifestyle. In your name we pray. Amen.